نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين اللهم الهمنا رشدا وعزنا من شرور انفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سوره محمد this sura was revealed in madina having 38 verses four stanzas and is the 47th by the order of arrangement we are going through the fifth group of the surahs of quran the first 10 surahs in the fifth group were revealed in makkah and the last three which we start today they were revealed in madina they being surah muhammad followed by surah al fath and last is surah al hujurat The surah derives its name from the second verse where Allah says wa aminu bima unzila ala Muhammad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited towards a uh, faith on all what was revealed on Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is also known as surah al qital because in the verse number 20 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa dhakkir fi al qital <coughs> and that this was like ordering them towards the fighting with the non muslims and battles with the non muslims regarding the period of revolution the surah testifies the contents and the subject of the surah they testified that it was sent down after the immigration of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from makka and at the time when the fighting had been adjoined to the muslims regarding the historical background we can realize that the surah was sent down in a time that muslims were being made the target of persecution and tyranny not only by the people of makkah but also by generally by all the people in um, the arab peninsula and it was a it was a very miserable situation for the muslims and although uh, under these conditions the muslims they had immigrated from makkah to medina but from every side, even till now the people of makkah they were not prepared to leave them alone and let them live in peace even even in medina they were not prepared to let them live in peace and they were simply bent upon exterminating the muslims and islam completely so under these situations the only alternative left with the muslims was that either they should surrender to the forces of ignorance giving up their mission of preaching the true faith and even following it in their private lives or they should just rise to uh, to uh, wage a war they should rise to wage a war at the cost of their lives to settle finally <coughs> and uh, even at the cost of their lives and for to raise the to spread the message of quran and um, hadith so on this account allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the muslims the same way of resolution and will which is the only way for the true believers and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first permitted the muslims to fight in the path of allah in surah hajj verse number 39 and then enjoined fighting in surah baqarah verse number 190 and by this time under the situations it was so difficult fighting because we know that there were just a handful of muslim in medina and they were even short of weapons because weapons which were needed to equip the soldiers for war could hardly be afforded by the people of medina and moreover the immigrants they were still homeless and they were not even settled and they were it was so difficult even to uh, maintain their basic livelihood in medina so under these difficult conditions 
uh, waging a war against the non-believers was an extremely difficult situation, but still it was ordered and enjoined for Muslims to carry on with battles. Now, under uh, so the theme of this uh, surah is to prepare the believers for war and to give them the preliminary instructions. That is why the surah is also known as Surah Al Qital. And uh, here, the Muslims they have been given the initial war instructions and they have been reassured. They have been strongly reassured of Allah's help and guidance, and they have been given hope for the best rewards on offering sacrifice in the cause of Allah. And they have also been assured that their struggle in the cause of the truth, it will not go waste, and they will be abundantly rewarded both in this world and in hereafter also. And also in the surah, regarding the disbelievers, it has been said that uh, they are deprived of Allah's support and guidance and none of their designs, it will succeed in their conflict with the, uh, with the believers and that they will meet a most evil fate both in the world and hereafter. So it was like all very reassuring and it was like very consoling for the Muslims. And after this, Allah has also mentioned about the hypocrites uh, those who were posing to be sincere to the Muslims before the command of the fight was sent down. But now after Allah ordered to fight, these hypocrites, they began to um, conspire with the disbelievers in order to save themselves from the hazards of war. And then the Muslims, they have been exhorted not to lose heart for being small in number or for being ill-equipped. And uh, they've been guided that they should not show weakness by offering peace to the disbelievers, and they should not they should come out with trust in Allah and clash with the mighty forces of disbelief. And Allah is with the Muslims, and they alone shall be victorious, is what they have been encouraged continuously. And Muslims have been invited to spend their wealth in the cause of Allah also. And although they were very economically very weak, but the importance of spending wealth was because it was needed to build up all forms of um, all forms of the arms which were needed for the mujahideen for the cause of fighting in the uh, in the path of Allah. So they were not just encouraged to um, struggle with their lives. They were not just told that they should be um, they should risk their lives only, but they were also uh, ordered to spend their wealth for the cause of jihad. So this is the basic topic and the basic theme which will be which we will be going through while we go through the verses of Surah Muhammad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allazina qafaru. وَاسْوَدُّوا أَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَزْوَلَّ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَآمَنُوا بِمَا نُزِّلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَهُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ قَفَّرَ أَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ وَأَصْلَحَ بَالَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here that those who disbelieve and avert people from the way of Allah, he will taste, he will waste their deeds. So in this first verse of Surah Muhammad, Allah is mentioning the punishment of those who are doing what? Swaddu an sabilillah. That is, they are trying to um, avert people <coughs> They are trying to avert and stop people from the way of Allah. Means that they are not just disbelievers. They themselves not only refrain from adopting the uh, way of Allah, but as well, they cause others to stop adopting the way of Allah also. There can be several ways of preventing others from adopting Allah's way. First being that one should forcibly prevent another person from believing. The second is that one should persecute the believer that it should become difficult for them to remain steadfast on faith and on, faith and on the path of Allah. 
Third being that one should mislead the people. They should misguide and mislead the people against religion and its followers in different ways, creating doubts, trying to defame Islam or defame the teachings of religion itself. And the fourth is to divert or to distract people by attracting them to other activities like was done as we went through in uh, Surah Luqman as Nazar bin Haris, he uh, started involving people in Nahwal Hadith. So these can be the four methods or the steps in which people can be misguided and they can be averted from the way of Allah. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that any person who attempts to do that, staying away himself and trying to keep people stay away from the way of Allah also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will waste their deeds. And those who believe and do righteous deeds and believe in what has been sent down upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it is the truth from their Lord, he will remove from them their misdeeds and amend their conditions. So in the totally contrast to that, to the verse number one, is a condition which is totally opposite to that, that a person who believes in the teachings of Prophet ﷺ, the messages of Quran revealed to Prophet ﷺ, and not only believe, but also do righteous deeds. Then for that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising that he will do what? وَقَفِّرْ Allah will remove from him سَيِّعَاتِهِمْ His bad deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will re remove his bad deeds and will do what? أَصْلِحْ بَالَهُمْ Will amend their conditions. So this, this reward is also uh, totally contrary to the punishment which was uh, being mentioned for the people in the first verse. Kafir anhum sayyatihim means what? This has two meanings. That Allah will wipe off from their records all those sins which they had committed in their pre-Islamic days of ignorance. And the second is that Allah will remove from them the evils of creed, thought, morals, and actions in which they were involved. And now their minds have changed. Their creed and ideas were changed. So now they, uh, there was faith in their hearts instead of ignorance and righteousness and uh, their acts instead of immoral evils. So this is these are two meanings of how وَقَفِّرْ أَنْهُمْ سَيِّعَاتِهِمْ And أَصْلِحْ بَالِهُمْ will be also, it has two meanings, that Allah will change their previous condition and put them on the right path. So like before their faith, they were misguided. They were not guided to the true path, but now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change their previous condition in which they were misguided and Allah will guide them. And the second meaning is that Allah has taken them out of the condition of weakness and helplessness and oppression. So previously when they were weak and helpless and oppressed, now after they will have faith, Allah will help them, Allah will support them, Allah will guide them, and they will defend themselves against the oppressors. And instead of living as subjects, they will now live and they will order their lives as free people. And will they, they will also have the upper hand instead of being subdued and suppressed. So this is the promise for all those who believe in the messages and teachings of Prophet Sallallahu and act with righteous deeds upon those messages. That is, why is this so? That is because those who disbelieve follow falsehood and those who believe follow the truth from their Lord. Thus does Allah present to the people their comparisons. So when you meet those who disbelieve in battle, strike their necks. When? Till when? Until when you have inflicted slaughter upon them, then secure their bonds and either confer favor afterwards or ransom them until the war lays down its burdens. That is the command. And if Allah had willed, he could have taken, he could have taken vengeance upon them himself, but he ordered armed struggle to test some of you by means of others. And those who were killed in the cause of Allah, never will he waste, never will he waste their deeds. 
So here, starting from these verses, uh, in this fourth verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving uh, the Muslims orders regarding the captives of war. And uh, this verse basically um, suggests that initially it has clearly suggested that the, the general law that the prisoners of war should not be put to death. This is the first suggestion which has been given in this verse that all the captives and the prisoners of wars, they should not be put to death. But since this verse, it, it has neither, it is not clearly forbidden to kill the prisoners. And uh, Prophet وسلم, according to this, and also according to the teachings of Quran, that if there was a special reason for which the ruler of an Islamic government regarded it as necessary to kill a particular prisoner, he could do so. How, uh, how many prisoners were killed in the different expeditions led by Prophet Sallallahu when captives, they received captives, like in the Battle of Badr, there were 70 captives taken. Out of these 70 prisoners, only two, Nadar bin Haris and um, uh, Uqba bin Abi Mu'id, the two, Uqba bin Abi Mu'id and Nadar bin Haris, they were just put to sword. And uh, similarly, in the Battle of Uhud, there was just one poet, Abu Azab, who was killed. And in Bani Qurayza, uh, they had surrendered on the condition that they would accept whatever decision Hazasad bin Mu'adh would give. And he had decided that all the males of Banu Qurayza should be killed. And that is why, and that was according to the law of the Jews when they uh, broke a pledge or an oath. So that is why this was the suggestion given by, according to their own laws. Similarly, in uh, the Battle of Khaybar, uh, just one person was killed, and in the conquest of Mecca, also a very few of the disbelievers were put to sword. And so uh, the Islamic government has been guided according to this verse and the teachings of Quran that they can be, the prisoners can be put to death if and when necessary. And uh, for example, like if there's a danger of the prisoner running away, or his committing a dangerous mischief, the guard can kill him. And uh, the mode of uh, the manner and the conduct in which, um, uh, in which a captive is allowed to be killed is, the three points have also been clarified in Islam, that if a prisoner accepts Islam, then he cannot be killed. Secondly, that uh, if a prisoner can be killed only as long as he is in the government's custody, when he has been handed over to somebody else's position, like being a slave to somebody else, then he cannot be killed. And third point is that if the prisoner has to be killed, a captive of the Muslims, it has to be, he has to be killed. He should be killed in a straightforward manner without being tortured to death. And uh, similarly, uh, as Allah has sent here, that they show favor to them or accept ransom from them. So what, the, what do we mean by showing favor to them? Uh, we learn from Quran and Hadith that it implies to four things. The first being that they should be treated well when they are prisoners that they should not be treated harshly and they should not be tortured or persecuted while they are in a state of being a prisoner or being a state of captive. The second is that instead of killing them or keeping them in captivity for lifelong, it is much preferable that they should be handed over to Muslim individuals as slaves. And the third is that they should be put under jizya and they should be made dhimmis in an Islamic state. And the fourth is the fourth option of uh, giving favor to them is that they should be set free. They should be set free without taking any form of ransom. Now, the three uh, manners of taking ransom has also been suggested according to the Quran and Hadith is, and the three ways of ransoming them is that number one, they should be set free on the payment of a ransom in form of any form of cash or in form of gold and silver or any kind. The second is that they should be set free after taking some special physical 
or any form of educational, any form of service from them of which they are capable. And uh, like in the Battle of Badr, when they were literate, some of the captives who were literate, the ransom for them was fixed that they will teach 10 Muslims. And when these 10 Muslims would learn how to read and write, then they would be set free. So the ransom for them was uh, fixed as teaching teaching to read and write, teaching to um, teaching the Muslims to read and write. And the third option is that they should be exchanged for Muslim prisoners. The Muslim pr uh, prisoners of wars who had been taken by the non-believers, they were exchanged for them. So these were the three ways of taking ransom. How did Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how was, how was the captives, they um, related during his life was we learn of many events in the life of Prophet Sallallahu like one of the prisoners, Abu Aziz. He accepted Islam later on, but he reports that uh, he was uh, handed over to a family of Ansar during the period of captivity, because you know, in those days there were no prisons. And so he was handed over to a family of Ansar Muslims. And he said that the, they used to, they were so kind and they were so nice and merciful to me that they used to give me bread morning and evening, but for themselves, they just used to have dates. And then there's uh, uh, an event of another prisoner, um, Suhail bin Amr. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, was suggested by Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he was a fiery speaker and he had been making speeches against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu requested that if you allow me, I should break his teeth. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Rahmatullah mean he said that if I have his teeth broken, Allah will break my teeth, although I am a prophet. It has been reported in, by Ibn Hasham. So this was the mercy and this was no forms of torture or oppression for the captives while they were in, in a period of captivity. Similarly, uh, in Bukhari and Muslim and Mustad Ahmad has been reported the story of uh, Samama bin Usal. He was the chief of Yamama and he had planned previously also uh, assassination of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And once he was brought as a prisoner and uh, he was a captive in Masjid Nabi and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met him and he asked him, Samama, what do you suggest should you be treated like? That is, that how do you suggest that we should treat you? And he replied that if I am killed, then such you will be killing a person who has killed your companions. And then that is who has shed the blood of your companions also. And if I am shown favor, then you will be showing favor to a person who appreciates favor. And if you will ask ransom, then you will receive a lot of wealth for my ransom. So Prophet Sallallahu just got the answers and he went back. The next day he came, he, may, he asked the same question, repeated his question, and Samama bin Usal gave the same three options. This happened for three days. And finally, Prophet Sallallahu ordered that Samama bin Usal should be set free. He was so impressed. He was so impressed by the kindness, by the mercy, and by the goodness of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he walked away in the desert and he took bath in a spring. He washed himself and cleaned, purified himself and he came back and he accepted Islam and he became a Muslim. And he announced to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, he explained the state of affairs, telling him that before this state, nobody was more detestable than you and no religion was more disliked to me than your religion in my sight. But since from now, now, for me, no man is more lovable and adorable to me than you. And no religion is more lovable and adorable to me than your religion. And then he announced that now onwards, the, all the effort and all the struggle and all the wealth which I had spent to oppose the teachings of Islam and to oppose the messages of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I vow to you and I make an oath to you that even a greater amount of time and effort and struggle and wealth will I spend to support the cause of Islam and in the path of Allah. 
And then he went to Mecca and he went to Mecca for Umrah and he announced to the people of Quraysh that he had accepted Islam. And after this, they should not expect that any grain will reach them from Yamama. Unless Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered him ordered him to do so or permitted him to do so. And when Prophet Sallallahu found out that he had stopped the grain supply to the people of Mecca when famine had struck them, Prophet Sallallahu told him, do not do that and continue to provide them with the grain which you used to previously. This is what? This is kindness. This is mercy. And this is extending help to humanity when they are when they are in misery and when they are in a crisis and then from among the prisoners of uh, banu qurayza we know that a uh, lot of them they were forgiven and um, they were they were handed over to um, they were forgiven also and then uh, regarding the battle of uh, bani mustalik they were taken prisoners and uh, Prophet Sallallahu regarding Hazrat Javeria, he paid his ransom to the person whom she had been allotted to and um, he, she was freed and then uh, by the order of Allah, he married her himself. And since Prophet Sallallahu married Hazrat Javeria bin Taharis, so the Muslims, they set their prisoners free, thinking that they had become the, uh, the they had become the relatives of Prophet Sallallahu And so hundreds of families, they were freed. Similarly, on the occasion of Treaty of Hadebia, there were 80 men from the direction of Tanin who had planned to attack Prophet Sallallahu and the companions uh, at night. But when they were, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got hold of them, they were captives, they were all set free and they were all released. Similarly, at uh, the conquest of Mecca, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forgave all the people of Mecca and only just a few Muslims, just only a few disbelievers, like it's been reported that about three or four people, they were put to sword. Similarly, um, the Battle of Hunain, when uh, the Havazan, they were taken as prisoners, they, the prisoners had been distributed. And the people of Banu Havazan, they came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, they said that they requested the people of uh, the captives to be freed and to be released. And if they wanted, they could pay the ransom. And by the time, since all the, all the captives, they had been distributed as slaves, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called all the companions and he asked them that they have come to seek forgiveness and they have asked for mercy and they have come to pay ransom for all their captives. And uh, if you set them free, it would it might open a door for them to embrace Islam, being impressed by the mercy and kindness and the righteousness of the Muslims. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu also suggested that if some of the Muslims wanted the ransom money, they would be given the money also. And so all the companions, they agreed. And like about 6,000 of the prisoners of uh, Banu Havazan, they were set free. And later, the tribe, impressed by the manner of the Muslims, they accepted Islam. So this is how the Muslims, they related with the captives and the prisoners of war. So this explanation, it makes it abundantly clear that Islam has formulated a comprehensive code in respect of the prisoners of war. He will guide them and amend their condition and admit them to paradise, which he has made known to them. So in this verse, number five and six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, is explaining the prophet what the martyrs uh, of uh, in the path of Islam will gain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that all those as you see in verse number four, Allah says, those who are killed in the cause of Allah, never will he waste their deeds. And what does he promise? He will guide them. He will amend their condition and he will, he will admit them to paradise, which he has made known to them. So here is what is the reward. And it is the prophet that martyrs falling in the path of Allah, they will gain. That number one is that Allah will guide them and he will set their condition right. And then he will admit them to paradise. We know that one of the door and the entrances of paradise has been named as what? Babul Jihad. And through it, only the Mujahideen of Islam will enter. 
verse number seven. O oh, you who have believed, if you support Allah, he will support you and plant firmly your feet. Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning two rewards to all those who support Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does he need the support of his bondsmen? Remember, what does supporting Allah mean? It means for clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need the support of his bondsmen to run the system of the universe. But what it actually means is to work for or to make effort and struggle for the preaching, the teaching, the spreading of the words of Quran and Hadith, and to strive or to make struggle and effort for the implementation of the system of Quran, and to work and to strive and struggle to guard the laws of Islam. So here, people who are involved in all these activities of preaching and teaching and spreading and implementing implementation and guarding of Islam, Allah promises for those that Allah will do what? That Allah will help them and Allah will support them and Allah will give them, Allah will bless them with steadfastness in the path of Allah and perseverance in deen. Ya muqallib al-qulubi sabbit qalbi ala deenik. Ya musarrif al-qulubi swarrif qalbi ala tu'atik. Rabbana sabbit aqdamana wansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. But those who disbelieve, for them is misery, and he will waste their deeds. That is, because they disliked what Allah revealed, so he rendered worthless their deeds. Have they not traveled through the land and seen how was the end of those before them? Allah destroyed everything over them, and for the disbelievers is something comparable. That is, because Allah is the protector of those who have believed, and because the disbelievers have no protector. Indeed, Allah will admit those who have believed and done righteous deeds to gardens beneath which rivers flow. But those who disbelieve enjoy themselves and eat as grazing livestock eats, and the fire will be a residence for them. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli zambin wa atubu alayk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse mentions a behavior of the disbelievers. These disbelievers, Allah comments, they eat as the grazing livestock. And the punishment for these disbelievers who eat like the grazing livestock has been mentioned as fire. So as Allah says, And the punishment is, So to save ourselves from the fire, what do we need to do? Number one, believe. And secondly, to refrain from this behavior, like eating like the livestock. So how do the animals graze and how do the animals eat? Animals eat and eat and eat. Like feeding is the purpose of their life. And they are eating or they are looking for food and they are enjoying food. And this is their life. You know, as it is said that there are people who eat to live and there are people who live to eat. So animals do what? They fit in the category of they just live to eat. So people who are living to eat are just eating like livestock. And you see the animals the whole day. They're just eating or they're just moving about to look for food and they are just worried all the time. The only worry which concerns them is to fill their belly, looking everywhere. Nothing concerns them is they have no concerns about whether the food that is being provided to them or when they have found out for themselves, is it clean, is it filthy, pure, impure, halal and haram. Moreover, they are not enjoined about restrictions of halal and haram, but they are not just bothered whether the food they're eating is clean or filthy or pure and impure. And they're not bothered if they have to snatch it from another animal. They have to kill or injure another animal for food. They eat whatever, whenever, wherever they get, and they eat as much as they can. No mannerism for eating as well. They are not bothered while eating that the other weaker partner is hungry, the other eat a partner is not eating, or a partner animal besides them is sick 
or the person or the animal beyond them, besides them is not well, is in pain or is hungry. They just keep on eating selfishly. And moreover, the animals they eat, sitting, walking in all conditions. How are we Muslims being instructed in Quran and Hadith to eat? It's not like the livestock. Allah says, Palu, washrubu, wala tusribu. Don't overindulge. Don't, don't get extravagant and don't be wasteful regarding your food and your drinks. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders all of us, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, qulu min tuayyibati ma razaknakum wa shkuru lillahi in kuntum iyahu ta'budun. Eat what is clean, what is pure, and what is halal, what is permitted, and then do what? Then be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are the believer. So this is how we need to be mindful when we eat. We need to be mindful whether it is permissible, whether it is halal, whether it is clean, pure. We should not be consuming all forms of eatables or drinks which are dirty, filthy, contaminated, infected, putrefied, rotted, or which are not earned by halal methods or which are not within the halal limits set by Quran and Hadith. Similarly, how much should we eat? Eat as much as you can is not the manner for a Muslim. Prophet said that the worst pot a person fills is his belly. And we've been told that the moment a Muslim, he eats in one gut and the shaitan, he eats in seven guts. How simple and how, how very simple we need to be in our, in consuming our, our food. We learn from a tradition by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that after the death of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she uh, was telling her nephew, Hazrat Urwa bin Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that, oh, nephew, one moon used to come and the second moon used to come and the third moon used to come and we never lit our stoves. We did not light fire in our stoves. And the, the nephew, he was, he inquired, then, oh, oh, aunt, what, what did you people eat? And she very simply said, without any complaining attitudes, she said, the same black thing and water, except that on a few occasions we did get milk from the from the goat of neighbors. So this was simplicity of meals and how simple Prophet was in his meals that he used to love pumpkins and goud and he used to eat the pieces and he used to pick them up and he used to keep on eating them. And moreover, he never used to complain. If he did not like some food, he would just keep quiet he would not eat it but there was there used to be no complaint launched by him and uh, then we need to eat when we are sitting and also not reclining eating while sitting erect and up, uh, upright is what we've been taught by the manner of prophet sallam and then before eating we need to wash our hands and we need to eat learn eating with the right hand and recite Bismillah rahman rahim before we start eating. And if we forget to recite Bismillah, then we recite Bismillah awwalahu wa akhirahu. And then when we are eating, we need to we need to sit and we need to sit erect and we need to eat from the front of the plate and not let our hand roam about in all the plate. This has been reported by Hazrat Anas Rosiallahu Ta'ala and who that when I used I was small and I was young and I was in the service of Prophet Sallallahu and when I used to eat my hand used to roam about in my plow uh, in my plate like taking a morsel from one part of the plate and the second from the other part of the plate and Prophet Sallallahu he used to to hold my hand and he used to tell me that when you eat, eat from the front part of your dish or your plate. And similarly, we learn from the manner of Prophet ﷺ that he used to eat with his hand, but he used to use three fingers and only one half of the finger used to be soaked with the curry or with the food. And uh, similarly, while drinking we uh, learn from the manner of Prophet ﷺ that he used to he used to sit down when he had to drink anything, and he used to take three breaths, 
and not breathing in the utensils was the instruction of uh, the words of hadith and then after we uh, and before starting drinking uh, prophet sallallahu has taught us a supplication for drinking of milk and he has also taught us a supplication for uh, to be recited when we and eating our food and uh, eating with each other combined meals and sharing the meals. And Prophet Sallallahu has been reported in Bukhari that he said that none of you will perfect or complete your Iman until and unless you, the situation is that your Iman will not be perfected if you fill up your own bellies, but your neighbors go hungry. And then he pointed with his fingers, 40 houses around the house of a person is what is the house of the neighbors. So this is how the believers are supposed to eat and drink in contrast to how the grazing livestock they eat and drink. And how many a city was stronger than your city in Makkah, which drove you out, we destroyed them and there was no helper for them. So is he who is on a clear evidence from his Lord, like to whom the evil of his work has been made attractive and they followed their own desires? Is the description of paradise which the righteous are promised, wherein are rivers of water unaltered, rivers of milk, the taste of which never changes, river of wine, delicious to those who drink, and rivers of purified honey in which they will have from all kinds of fruits uh, and rivers of purified honey, and in which, in which Jannah they will have from all kinds of fruits and what forgiveness from their Lord, like that of those who abide eternally in fire and are given to drink scalding water that will severe their intestines. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned here again Jannah as a reward for all those who are piety and stick with steadfastness to righteousness and fear Allah. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. And here has been mentioned four rivers of Jannah. We learn from traditions that these four rivers of Jannah, they will start from under the throne of Allah and they will be starting from Jannatul Firdaus, that is the highest rank of Jannah. And we learn that from here, Allah is explaining that the water of the water of the rivers of Jannah will be clear and they, the water will be unaltered because we know that the stagnant water in this worldly life, it develops a stench, it develops a bad smell and just, just starts putrefying and it develops a bad taste and smell also. And similarly, we um, Allah is mentioning here that the rivers of milk, the taste will never change because we know that in this worldly life, the milk, if allowed to stand, it just starts, it just goes bad and it spoils very quickly. And similarly, uh, Allah mentions that the rivers of vine, they will be delicious. Whereas we know here that all forms of intoxicant drinks here in this worldly life, they have a very offensive order. They have an offensive odor and they have a very unpleasant taste also because obviously they have been prepared because of a process of putrefaction and rotting. So they have a very offensive odor and a very unpleasant taste. And then mentions purified honey because you know here when honey is extracted from the beehive, then it does contain some pieces of the wax or the fragments of the hives or some parts of the body of the bees also. But the honey of Jannah, it will be clean and it would be pure with nothing of the sort. And uh, the drinks of Jannah will be free from all forms of impurities and all forms of uh, problems and issues we have with these drinks in this worldly life. And um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also compared these drinks of Jannah with the drinks of hellfire. Allahumma ajirna min nar Rabba nasrif anna azaba jahannum inna azabaha qana gharama inna hasaat mustaqarrum wa maqama rabbibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah Allahumma inni as'aluqal jannatul firdaus. 
and among them, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are those, are those who listen to you, who listen to you until when they depart from you, they say to those who were given knowledge, what has he said just now? Those are the ones of whom Allah has sealed over their hearts and who have followed their own desires. And those who are guided, he increases them in guidance and gives them his gives them their righteousness. Then do they await except that the hour should come upon them unexpectedly, but already there, there, there have come some of its indications. Then what good to them when it has come will be their remembrance. So know that there is no deity except Allah and ask forgiveness for your sins for the believing men and believing women. Allahumma ghfir lana walil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat. And Allah knows of your movement and your resting place. Those who believe say, why has a surah not been sent down? But when a precise surah is revealed and fighting is mentioned therein, you see those in whose hearts is hypocrisy looking at you with look of one overcome by death and more appropriate for them would have been obedience and good words and when the matter of fighting was determined if they had been true to allah it would have been better for them so would you perhaps if you turned away cause corruption on earth and severe your ties of relationship those who do so are the ones that allah has cursed so he deafened them and blinded their vision. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran or are there, are there locks upon their hearts? Indeed, those who reverted back to disbelief after guidance had become clear to them, shaitan enticed them and prolonged hope for them. That is because they said to those who disliked what Allah sent down, will, we will obey you in part of the matter and Allah knows what they conceal. Then how will it be when the angels take them in death, striking their faces and their backs? That is because they followed what angered Allah and disliked what earns his player. And so he rendered worthless their deeds. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously mentioning about the behavior, about the response of the uh, hypocrites when the order of the battle in our uh, fighting in the path of Allah was announced and enjoined upon the Muslims. How do they behave? How did, how did they relate and react and reciprocate to the orders? And Allah is mentioning their punishments also. Or do those in whose hearts is a disease think that Allah would never expose their feelings of hatred? And if we willed, we could show them to you and you would know them by their marks, but you will surely know them by the tone of their speech and Allah knows your deeds. And we will surely test you until we make evident those who strive among you for the cause of Allah and the patient and we will test your affairs. Indeed, those who disbelieved and averted people from the path of Allah and opposed the messenger after guidance had become clear to them, never will they harm Allah at all, and he will render worthless their deeds. O oh, you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the messenger and do not invalidate your deeds. Remember all the deeds which our, which are not carried on without obeying Allah and his messengers, they will be what? They will be invalidated on the day of judgment. Indeed, those who disbelieved and averted people from the path of Allah and then died while they were disbelievers, never will Allah forgive them. So do not weaken and call for peace while you are superior and Allah is with you and will never deprive you of the reward of your deeds. This worldly life is only amusement and diversion. And if you believe and fear Allah, he will give you your rewards and not ask you for your properties. If he should ask you for them, and press you, you would withhold, and he would expose your unwilling, 
unwillingness, here you are, those invited to spend in the cause of Allah, but among you are those who withhold out of greed, and whoever withholds, only withholds benefit for himself, and Allah is free from need, while you are the needy, and if you turn away, he will replace you with another people, then they will not be likes of you. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana bada is hadaytana wa hablana milatun karahma. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. Watub alayna innaka anta tawabu rahim. Rabbana innana amanna faqfir lana zanubana wakina azab al nar. Wakina azab al qabri. Wakina azab al hashri. Wakina azab al mizan. Surah Al Fat. This surah is also being revealed in Medina and it has 48 words. It has 111 verses. Uh, it has, uh, sorry, it has uh, 29 verses and it has four stanzas and it has been, uh, it is the 48th by the order of arrangement and it is. Uh, 111th by the order of revolution and the name it gets is from the first verse where Allah says Inna where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quote, calling and uh, naming the treaty of Hadibia as what as a clear conquest so when we come across these verses which have been revealed in the stay of the life of Prophet وسلم, in Medina, we learned the historical background was that Prophet وسلم, he was shown a vision, a dream. And the dream was that he saw that he had went to Mecca with his companions and he was performing Umrah there. We know that the dream of the prophets could not be just mere dreams or fiction, but they were actually what? They were divine inspirations of Allah himself. And they were basically what? They were the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what has been confirmed in the verse number 27, that this dream which was shown to Prophet ﷺ was actually what? An order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to perform Umrah. Now, uh, what was the actual state of affairs in Mecca was that the disbelievers of uh, Quraysh, they had debarred the Muslims from proceeding to Kaaba for the last six years. And uh, since the battle of Ohad, uh, since the battle of Badr, before that, they had they had debarred the Muslims for performing of Umrah or for Hajj. So therefore, it could not be expected that they would allow Prophet ﷺ to enter Mecca along with the party of his companions. If they had to proceed to, to Mecca to make their uh, Umrah or Hajj with the intention of performing Umrah along with their arms, they would have provoked the enemy to war. And if they had proceeded unarmed, this would be a meaning to endanger their lives and the lives of the companions both. So this was like a very difficult decision. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu however, because it was an order of Allah, so he informed, he informed the companions of his dreams and he began to make preparations for the journey. And he made a public announcement that whoever wanted to join him could join. And the companions, it was like what? It was like as if they were going into the very jaws of death. It was a very difficult decision, but all those who had true faith in Allah and his messengers, they were least bothered about the consequences. And hence, after a period, about 1400 of companions, they accompanied Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this highly, highly, highly dangerous journey. And they left Medina in uh, the sixth a uh, year of uh, after the migration to Medina in the month of Zilhaj, 
and when they reached Zul Khalifa, they, uh, they entered the pilgrim robes and they had also taken 70 camels with collars around their necks, indicating that these were the animals which were to be sacrificed after they had completed their Umrah. And they just, all the companions, they had just kept one sword in sheets. And uh, this was allowed. This was allowed according to the rules of uh, uh, Mecca and Medina. And they reciting labbaik Allahumma labbaik, they left for Makkah. Now, the whole of the Arab Peninsula, they were looking up in amazement. And the Quraysh, they were obviously, they were confounded by this bold step which was taken by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because uh, the situation and the state of affairs now, if you need to assess was that it was Zilqad and Zilqad was one of the forbidden months. So they, they, it had been forbidden any form of war or killing or looting or plundering. It had been forbidden in these four months as sacred for pilgrimage in, in um, Arabs for since the last many centuries it had been so. So the people of Quraysh, they were caught in a dilemma. If they attacked the caravan from Medina, and then stop them from entering Mecca, this would obviously allow a protest in the whole country. And on the contrary, and on the contrary, if they allowed the Muslims to enter Mecca, this would mean what? If they had attacked them and if they had blood, if they had shed their blood, then this would do what? This would obviously cause the entire Arab Peninsula to revolt against them. But on the other hand, if they had allowed Prophet and his large caravan to enter the city safely and to perform Umrah, they would obviously, this would mean that they would lose their image of power and people would say that they were afraid of Prophet So they were in a fix. It was such a difficult decision for them to decide what to do. Finally, wherever they finally they, they took a decision that at no cost they would not allow the caravan to enter the city of Makkah and this was their final decision and they started planning different strategies did they adopt one of them was that um, they sent Hazrat Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala and who he till then he was not a Muslim and he was still a disbeliever till then till 6th AH he was a uh, he was a non-believer and he, they, they sent Hazrat Khalid bin Walid with an army of uh, 200 and they advanced towards Qura al to intercept Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the purpose was to intercept them and to provoke Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions towards war. So that when the Muslims would, on provoking, the Muslims would start the war as a retaliation or as a re reaction, then they would justify attacking uh, the Muslims. But however, when Prophet ﷺ, he found this, he changed his route and he followed a very rugged and a rocky track to reach Hadebia. And when he reached Hadebia and he put his camps there and the Muslim and the people of Mecca, they found out that Prophet Sallallahu had put his camps in Hadebia. Then there were many uh, leaders of many different tribes who approached Prophet Sallallahu The first was uh, Budail bin Warqa. Budail bin Warqa, he was the leader of uh, Banu Khuza. He came to Prophet Sallallahu and he asked him the reason why he had come. And he tried to convince and motivate Prophet Sallallahu to return without performing Umrah. But Prophet Sallallahu clearly told him that he had come without any form of uh, arms and he had no intentions of war. All what he intended was to worship, to do Umrah, and to go around the Haram. And that was all. And they had come in total state of peace with no intentions of war. So um, um, uh, Budel bin Warqa, he went back to the leaders of Quraysh and told him the intentions of Prophet Sallallahu but the Quraysh were obstinate and they stuck up to what their decision was.
Then Holes bin Alkama of Ahabish, he also came to persuade Prophet Sallallahu to go back, but Prophet Sallallahu did not accept his suggestion and clearly told him what he had told the previous leader also. And he also went back, the Holes bin Alkama, he went back to the Quraysh chief and he clearly told them that these Muslims, they had no object to uh, other than to pay visit to Kaaba. And uh, if the Quraysh, they had debarred the Muslims, uh, the Ahabish, they would not join him, join them in this purpose. So, and then uh, Orwa bin Masood Saqafi. Orwa bin Masood Saqafi was sent to investigate the state of affairs of Prophet Sallallahu and his companions and their intentions and their plannings. And uh, Urba bin Masood Saqafi was sent by the people of Quraysh for this purpose. And when he came here, he, um, he also tried to explain the whole state of affairs to Prophet Sallallahu and he asked him, tried to convince and persuade him to go back. But Prophet Sallallahu again had the same answer which he had for the previous chief chiefs of the tribes and um, Urba bin Masood Saqafi, he came back and what he told the Quraysh was, he said that I have been to the courts of Kesar and Kisra and Negus and by God, never have I ever seen any people so devoted to the king as are the companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said what he had seen, he told that if Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes evolution, then they don't even let the water fall on the ground, but they, they would rub it on their bodies and their clothes. Now you can decide what you need to do. So he was also like not suggesting them to fight or to attack the Muslims. In the meantime, when the messages of all the different chiefs, they kept on continuing, um, Quraysh again tried to agitate. They keep kept on trying again and again. <coughs> the Quraysh at the same time they were sending the chiefs also for trying to persuade Prophet Sallallahu and convince him to return but at the same time they kept on trying again and again to launch launch silent attacks against the Muslims so that these silent attacks would not be realized by anybody. And in response to the silent attacks, if Muslims retaliated and reciprocated with war, then they would get a chance to attack and they would get a justification to attack the Muslims saying that they were the ones who had started the war. And uh, one night, a group of about 40 of the disbelievers, they attacked the Muslim camp at night and they were all caught and they were taken as prisoners. But in the morning, Prophet Sallallahu released them all and let them all go. Similarly, on another occasion, 80 men, they came from the direction of Tanim right at the time of Fajr. And uh, they made a certain attack. All of them were again taken captives, but Prophet Sallallahu released them all also. And uh, then Prophet Sallallahu sent Hazrat Usman, Razi Allah Ta'ala Anhu, he sent them, uh, he was sent as a messenger and as an ambassador to decide the final decision to um, finally to decide how the Muslims and how the Meccans were going to go about and finally to decide what uh, had to be done. But uh, the Quraysh, they stopped. They did not agree to all the suggestions Hazrat Usman had to make and uh, they withheld Hazrat Usman anhu. And in this period, a rumor spent that the Quraysh, they had they had killed Hazrat Usman Raziallahu ta'ala and now this was the last, this was the last thing. And now the Muslims, they could not show any forbearance any longer because, you know, assassination and murdering of the ambassador itself was what? It was an open declaration of war. So that is, that was what? that seemed to be this news and this rumor of Hazrat Usman ta'ala, and who being killed by the Quraysh was indirectly what an open declaration of war by the Quraysh and Prophet Sallallahu took the declaration as brave, courageous Muslims and he announced battle and he summoned all the companions together and he took a solemn pledge from all of them that they would fight to death. And 1400 of all the companions all the companions without, all of them without any weapons, like 250 miles away from their city, 
and with the enemy in their own city, it was like what? Again, like walking in, into the jaws of death. But all of them, they made a pledge with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam under a tree. And they all pledged with their hands on Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hands. And this has been mentioned as the pledge of Ridwan. Ridwan means the player and that it was a pledge by the companions, which really pleased Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And uh, then uh, while this pledge was being made, and the Muslims had made the pledge of fighting the Muslims, uh, fighting the disbelievers of Makkah till their death and till their last breath. At the same time, they saw that Hazrat Usman ta'ala and who came back and he walked back. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had just put them into trial, but they had succeeded in receiving the player of Allah. And then the Quraysh, they sent Suhail bin Amr to make a treaty and they, uh, there was a, a deputation from uh, the Quraysh to negotiate with Prophet Wasallam, And then the Treaty of Hadebiya was made. And the different uh, terms and conditions of the Treaty of Hadebiya was that there, were, there was a no war pact that war would remain suspended for the next 10 years. That is the war between the Muslims of Medina and the disbelievers of Mecca for the next 10 years, there would be a no war pact. And uh, then there was another point was that if any person from uh, the people of Quraysh, he went over to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or to Medina, then without his guardian's permission, then the Muslims would return them back to the people of Quraysh. But if a companion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came over to Quraysh, then Quraysh will not hand them back over to the Muslims. And then uh, the Muslim tribes, there were different, there were different uh, points regarding the Muslim tribes. And then another point was that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the companions this year, they would go back without performing Umrah and they would come back the following year to perform Umrah and they will stay in Makkah for three days the next year. So the treaty was signed between the Muslims and between the disbelievers. And uh, when the treaty was uh, to be signed, it was written for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's name. It was, it, it was written as Muhammad Rasulullah. And uh, Suhail bin Amr, when he was about to sign, and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was about, he was about to sign Suhail bin Amr. He said that just leave the name of Muhammad and remove the words of Rasulullah, because we do not believe in that. And uh, when he asked Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who, who was uh, a wise for Prophet sallallahu in the whole process, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who refused to remove the words of Rasulullah. But Suhail bin Amr, he refused to sign the treaty. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, very humbly, he asked Hazrat Ali Razillahu Ta'ala and who that were, because obviously Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not literate and he could not read where the words were and he could not recognize the words. So he asked Hazrat Ali Razillahu Ta'ala and who to indicate where these words were and he rubbed them off himself to ensure that the treaty did proceed. So this is the humbleness of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, this gives a precedence to us that in certain conditions, when it becomes mandatory, there can be a treaty of peace signed between the Muslims and the non-believers also. Now, the two things of the treaty, which were highly disturbing for the Muslims, because the Muslims were very disturbed by this treaty of uh, Hadebia. The two points which were highly disturbing for the Muslims were, the first thing was that this was a very unfair condition. They thought that it was being very unfair by the disbelievers of Mecca, that when a person from Mecca go comes to Medina, then the Muslims will return them to the people of Mecca. But when somebody from Medina will go to Mecca, the people of Mecca would not retain their, return them to people of Medina. They said that this was very unfair. But Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi explained to them that what use would he to be us? That a person who goes from Medina to Mecca, they will obviously he will be of no use to us who fled from us to them. May Allah keep him away from us. And if we return the one who flees from who flees from um, who flees to us from them, Allah will create some other way for him. So this was reliance in Allah, and this was what Prophet Sallallahu explained to them. And the fourth condition that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions would, would relieve, uh, they would return without performing Umrah. This they were concerning, they were considering as humiliating. 
And this they thought was extremely dishonoring and disrespectful for Prophet Sallallahu And they were all very hurt and they were all very upset. And you know what? When Prophet Sallallahu he came back to his camp after the Treaty of Hadebia had been signed. What happened was Abu Jandal, a companion who had accepted Islam in Mecca, and he was being he was being awfully tortured and persecuted by the people of Mecca. He somehow managed to escape and he reached Prophet Sallallahu camp. And he implored Prophet Sallallahu that he helped secure his release from the imprisonment. And you know what? We learn that he had, he had, he was all, he had fetters on his feet and there were signs of violence on his body. And there was blood dripping out from all the wounds of his body because of all injuries which had been, uh, which had been made on his body by the, by the oppressors. And he asked for help and he asked for, uh, for the support. But Prophet Sallallahu said that you have to return because I have made a pact with the Treaty of Adepia. How difficult it was and how dejected the companions were. But this conveys to all the Muslims of the Ummah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that how important keeping of oaths and how important keeping of pledge, even with the disbelievers, is. And then the Prophet ﷺ, obviously they were to return without performing Umrah. And according to the laws and teachings of Quran, they were supposed to sacrifice and slaughter their animals. And they were supposed to shave their heads before they take off the ihram. So Prophet ﷺ, he addressed them and he ordered them to slaughter their animals and to shave off their heads and then to take off their ihram. But you know, all those companions who had agreed for the pledge of Radhvan just a few hours from now, showing a remarkable obedience, Samehna wa Atwana, what remarkable obedience they had displayed a few hours. But now, when they were disappointed, they were in a state of anxiety and tension and depression, and they were detected and they were disappointed. Then what happened? Not, not even one of them, not even the one of the obedient companions did they get up and did they move from their place. What disobedience? Prophet ﷺ repeated the orders thrice, but none of them but Janinj. He was, Prophet ﷺ was upset and uh, he came inside the camp and there, there was Hazrat Umi Salma radiallahu ta'ala and her. She consoled him and she said that you just quietly go and you slaughter your own camel and you call your Baba and then you have your head shaved and you will see that all the people will automatically do what you do. And that is exactly, it was a very good suggestion. And Prophet Salaam got up, he slaughtered his animals, he got his head shaved and all the companions who listening to the words of Prophet Salaam had disobeyed. But when they saw the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu all of them got up with a very heavy heart and they obeyed the Sunnah. And then they returned to, uh, on their way back to uh, Medina, they were, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he had stopped over in Qura al that all for the consolation and for the explanation of the state of affairs, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed the verses of Surah Al-Fat and explained to all those Muslims and all those companions who were extremely dejected. They were extremely dejected. Like we know that even Hazrat Umar, a person who had a strong faith like Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who, he also, he also was disappointed and he was so upset that he says himself that he had nev never ever given way to doubt since he had embraced Islam. But on this occasion, he could not avoid this. And he was so impatient that he went to Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, and he said that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, is he, that is Prophet Wasallam, is he not Allah's messenger? Are we not Muslims? And are we not people of faith? And are these not the disbelievers and the polytheists? Then why, why should we agree to what is humiliating to our faith? And Hazrat Abu Bakr consoled in him and he said that, O Umar, he surely is Allah's messenger and Allah will never make him the loser. 
So they were consoling each other, but still they were depressed and disappointed and they were anxious and they were upset. So when they had stopped over in Qura al-Ghamam, the verses of Surah al-Fatih were revealed and they were told that they, all of them, they were dejected on a thing which was not true. Actually, this treaty of Hadebia was what? It was Fatho Mubin. It was an open victory. It was a conquest for the Muslims. And how it was a victory or success or a conquest for Muslims, it was explained. The highlighting the features, how it was a great victory was that in it, after signing the treaty of Hadebia, in it for the first time, the existence of the Islamic State of Medina was duly recognized first time by the people of Mecca. Till now, in the eyes of all the peoples of Arab Peninsula, Prophet and his companions, they were no more. They were no more than just mere religious rebels. And they were just considered as outlaws. And now recognizing their sovereignty, their territory, and recognizing that the people of Mecca were having a treaty. So it means that they had recognized that Medina was what? It was an Islamic Republic of Medina. And Islam was a recognized religion. So this was an actual victory. Secondly, by admitting the right of pilgrimage to the house of Allah for the Muslims next year, Quraysh had also admitted that Islam was not just anti-religious creed, but it was one of the accepted religions of the Arab Peninsula. And the signing, the third point is that signing of a no war pact. The no war pact for the next 10 years, it provided full peace to the Muslims of Medina, and once they were peaceful, and they were peaceful from the attacks of the people of Mecca, they had all the time, they had all the time and the energy and the resources to spread Islam to every nook and corner of Arabia. And they preached Islam, and they spread Islam. Not only did they have time, and they had the, they had the energy to do all this, there were also many other any other expeditions like the immediately the next year, that is the seventh year after migration, there was what? There was the expedition of Khaybar. And uh, immediately after the Treaty of Hadebia, Muslims, they got a stronghold of Jews of Khaybar, and then they were conquered areas of Fadak and uh, Wadi al-Qura and Tema and Tabuk also fell to Islam one after the other. And this was all why, because there was a no war pact with the people of Mecca. And uh, this was all indirectly, this was all what? This was a victory for the Muslims. And these were the blessings that the Muslims gained from the peace victory. And they were looking upon it as a defeat. And the Quraysh, uh, they thought that the Quraysh had turned victorious and the Muslims had become, um, had been defeated. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verses of Surah Al-Fat explained that the Muslims actually had been victorious and the Quraysh had been actually defeated. And another story which happened was that a companion has that the Abu Basir Hazrat Abu Basir, he also escaped from Quraysh and he reached Medina. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uh, returned him to the people of Quraysh. And uh, because obviously, uh, because of the treaty and the pledge, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had met, uh, had kept, he kept his words. And then uh, after some time, Hazrat Abu Basir, he managed to escape again. And the people of Makkah could not arrest him. And then he, rather coming to Medina, he settled on the road of uh, the Red Sea. And then he settled on the shore of the Red Sea. And from here, the caravans of the people of Makkah used to pass. And when he settled here, then this became, uh, became a center. It became a center for all those people who had escaped from the people of Mecca. All those Muslims, the believers who had converted to Islam in Mecca, and they uh, managed to escape the oppressors rather than now they coming to Medina, they used to come at the settlement of Abu Basr, that is by the Red Sea. And there they used to stop, they would attack 
any Quraysh caravan, trade caravans of Quraysh, they passed away. And finally, the people of Quraysh, they asked and they requested Prophet Sallallahu to take these people to Medina so that all their trade caravans could stay safe from their attacks. So this is Allah. And this is how we learn the rule of Allah. Inna Allah ma'aswabideen. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura. So uh, going through this historical background and all the events of the Treaty of Hadebia, now, inshallah, if we read the verses of Surah Al-Fat, I'm sure, inshallah, we will be able to understand and relate the messages of the verses. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna fatahna laqa fatham mubina. لِيَغْفِرَ لَقَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ زَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخْرَ وَيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَيَحْدِيَكَ سِرَاطًا مُسْتَقِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, we have given you a clear conquest. So Allah here, right at the first verse of Surah Al-Fat has called what? As Treaty of Hadebia as a clear cut conquest and victory. And there Allah explains the purpose of the Treaty of Hadebia, that Allah got it done. Why? That Allah may forgive you for what preceded of your sin and what will follow and complete his favor upon you and guide you to a straight path. And that Allah may aid you with a mighty victory. It is he who sent down tranquility into the hearts of the believers that they would increase in faith along with their present faith. And to Allah belong the soldiers of heaven and earth and ever is Allah knowing and wise. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that the, uh, the people of Makkah and the soldiers and enemies of Makkah, they were doing what? They had a evil plan to instigate the Muslims, to instigate the Muslims, to trigger them to initiate the war so that they would get a justification to attack the Muslims and they would not be uh, they would not be on the falsehood if they attack the Muslims. But here Allah says that it was Allah who sent down tranquility into the heart of the companions to help them stay in a self control in a state of self control and to avoid retaliation to the tricks of the people of Makkah. And that he may admit the believing men and the believing women to the gardens beneath which rivers flow to abide therein eternally and to remove from them their misdeeds. And ever is that in the sight of Allah a great attainment. And that he may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women and the polytheists men and the polytheist women, those who assume about Allah an assumption of evil nature upon them is a misfortune of evil nature. And Allah has become angry with them and has cursed them and prepared for them hell and evil it is as a destination. And to Allah belong the soldiers of the heavens and the earth and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. Indeed, we have sent to you as a witness and a bringer of good tidings and a warner that you people may believe in Allah and his messenger and honor him and respect the prophet and exalt Allah morning and afternoon. Indeed, those who pledged, those who pledged allegiance, those who pledged allegiance to you, they are actually pledging allegiance to Allah. The hands of Allah is over their hands. This is what Allah is mentioning about the pledge of Ridwan. The hand of Allah is over their hands. So he who breaks his words only breaks it to the detriment of himself. And he who fulfills that which he has promised Allah, he will give him a great reward. Those who remained behind of the Bedouins will say to you, our properties and our families occupied us. So ask forgiveness for us. They say with their tongues, what is not within their hearts? Say, then could you prevent Allah at all? If he intended for you harm or intended for you benefit, rather ever is Allah with what you do acquainted. But you thought that the messenger and the believers would never return to their families 
ever, and that was that was was and uh, ever. I repeat again. But you thought who the hypocrites of Medina? You thought that the messenger and the believers would never return to their families ever, and that was made pleasing in your hearts. And you assumed an assumption of evil and became a people ruined. And whoever has not believed in Allah and His messengers, then indeed we have prepared for the disbelievers a place. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. He forgives whom He wills and punishes whom He wills. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. Those who remained behind will say, when you set out towards the war booty to take it, let us follow you. They wish to change the words of Allah, say, never will you follow us. Thus did Allah say before, so they will say, rather you envy us. But in fact, they were not understanding except a little Say to those who remained behind of the Bedouins, you will be called to face a people of great military might. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning on the, while the Treaty of Hadebia has been signed, the expedition of Khaybar and the victory of Khaybar, that you will be called to a people of great military might. You may fight them or they will submit. If you obey, Allah will give you a good reward. But if you turn away, as you turned away before, he will punish you with a painful punishment. There is upon the blind, there is not upon the blind any guilt, or upon the lame any guilt, or upon the ill any guilt for remaining behind. <coughs> and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, he will admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow. But whoever turns away, he will punish him with a painful punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all, make us all obedient to Allah and his prophet and save us all from this painful punishment. Certainly was Allah pleased with the believers when they pledged allegiance to you under the tree and he knew what was in their hearts. So he sent down tranquility upon them and rewarded them with an imminent conquest and much war booty which they will take and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise and Allah has promised you much booty that you will take in future and has hastened for you this victory and withheld the hands of people from you that it might be a sign for the believers and that he may guide you to a straight path so in these verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised and mentioned a about the victories of the Khaybar expedition and the victories of the Tabuk expedition also. And he promises other victories that you were so far unable to realize which Allah has already encompassed and ever is Allah over all things competent. And if those people of Mecca who disbelieve had fought you, they would have turned their backs in flight and then they would not have found any protector or helper. This is the established way of Allah, which has occurred before, and never will you find in the way of Allah any change. <coughs> and it is he, it is he who withheld their hands from you and your hands from them within the area of Mecca after he caused you to overcome them and ever is Allah of what you do seeing. So in this verse number 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the blessing. Allah explains that it was with the blessing and with the help of Allah that with peace and contentment, there was peace, contentment, and tranquility in the hearts of the Muslims that they avoided retaliating to the enemy. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people of Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he stopped them from attacking the Muslim also. So it was just 
what Allah had willed. And what happens is what Allah decides. What happens is what Allah wills. And when Allah decides and when Allah plans something, he creates the conditions, the resources, and the situations to carry on and conduct his plans. And that is exactly what his plan was under this situation. Verse 25. They are the ones who disbelieved and obstructed you from Masjid al-Haram while offering, while the offering was prevented from reaching its place of sacrifice. And if not for the believing men and the believing women whom you did not know that you might trample them and there would be, there would befall you because of them dishonor without your knowledge, you would have been permitted to enter Makkah. This was so that Allah might admit to his mercy whom he willed. If they had been apart from them, we would have punished those who disbelieved among them with painful punishment. <coughs> this verse number 25 is an answer to the criticism of the hypocrites. Now the hypocrites, they were saying, that if Allah wanted, he could bless the Muslims with victory even on this, on this occasion. The hypocrites were saying that since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always uh, promises Prophet sallallahu and his companions victory, <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always promised that he will help Muslims and he will help Allah uh, he will help Prophet Sallallahu and his companions and they will come out victorious. Then why? Why was there not a battle this time? Why wasn't there a battle this time? Allah could have arranged a battle this time and let the Muslims come out victorious even here. Despite the fact that they were 215 miles away and they were unarmed, but obviously if Allah had promised them, Allah could help them help come out victorious even now. Why was this battle stopped? And why wasn't the battle allowed? And why wasn't Prophet Wasallam came out victorious the way Allah had promised? So that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering in this verse to all the criticism of the hypocrites. Allah mentions that the battle was prevented between the people of Makkah and the Muslims. Why? Because in Makkah, there were some new converts. There were new converts to Islam. And these were the people who had actually concealed their faith for the, few, uh, for the fear of persecution by the people of Makkah. And even, you know, the Muslims did not know these people who had accepted Islam and had kept their faith conceived. So if Muslims under these situations, if the Muslims had entered Makkah and they had a battle with the people of Makkah and they had fought the Meccans, then the Muslims of Medina, not knowing, not knowing the new converts, they might have killed these new converts. So to prevent the Muslims shedding the blood of Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam return without Umrah and he stopped the war from occurring. This highlights what? This highlights how disliked it is in the eyes of Allah for a Muslim to shed the blood of a Muslim brother. That Prophet Sallallahu was returned without performing Umrah and Allah deterred the conditions of actual fighting and battle in Makkah and making the Muslims return without either of the two. When those who disbelieved had put into their hearts showism, what did you do? <coughs> when, those, <coughs> when those who disbelieved had put into their hearts Chauvism, the chauvism of the time of ignorance, but Allah sent down his tranquility upon his messenger and upon the believers and imposed upon them the words of righteousness and they were and they were more deserving of it and worthy of it and ever is Allah of all things knowing. Certainly has Allah showed to his messenger the vision in truth. 
you will surely enter al-masjid al-haram if allah wills in safety with your heads shaved and your heart and your hair shortened not fearing anyone he knew what you did not know and has arranged before that a conquest near at hand it is he who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religions and sufficient is allah as a witness muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of allah and those with him are forceful so in this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the traits and the manners of the companions of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the companions are like what those with him are forceful against the disbelievers are merciful among themselves that is for the believers you see them bowing and prostrating in prayer seeking bounty from allah and his player their marks their mark is on their faces from the traces of prostration that is their description in taurat and their description in injil is as a plant which produces its offshoots and strengthens them so they grow firm and they stand upon their stalks delighting the sower so that allah may enrage by them the disbelievers allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds among them forgiveness and a great reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the righteous make us among the believers make us among the pious and make us among those who fear Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all Allah bless us all with this great reward Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha Allahumma aini ala ghamaratil maut wa sakaratil maut Allahumma anis wahshati kabri Allahumma anis wahshati hashri Allahumma hasibna hisab yasira Allahumma ajirna minan nar Rabbibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسيبون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين